Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Before we start with our practice questions for the day, a gentle reminder. As part of our political thinkers and ideas, today's topic discussion would be John Locke. This will be exclusively available on our Telegram channel. So please do join the channel so that you get all the current affairs related updates. Let's get started and look into the first question. Consider the following statements with respect to Loka Yuktas. The institution was first established in the state of Rajasthan. Judicial qualifications are prescribed for Loka Yukta in Bihar, Maharashtra and Rajasthan. In most of the states, Loka Yukta can initiate investigation show of motto. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The answer to this is three only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the Loka Yukta. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, the institution was first established in the state of Rajasthan. This statement is wrong. That is because the institution for the first time was established back in the year 1971 in the state of Maharashtra. It is not Rajasthan, it is Maharashtra. So the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, Judicial qualifications are prescribed for Loka Yukta in Bihar, Maharashtra and Rajasthan. This statement is wrong. That is because when you look into some states like Uttar Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Odisha, Karnataka and Assam, these states are where judicial qualifications are prescribed for the Loka Yukta. But when it comes to states like Bihar, Maharashtra and Rajasthan, there are no specific qualifications that are prescribed. So judicial qualifications are prescribed in other states but not in these states, which is why the second statement is also wrong. When you look into the third statement, in most of the states, Loka Yukta can initiate investigation Shuomoto. This statement is right. What do you mean by Shuomoto? Let's say, for example, there is a corruption issue. In the corruption issue, there is a person who happens to be the victim. He would have gone through it. So he has a grievance. So he puts it out. So he goes and complains to the Loka Yukta. But in few other cases, the Loka Yukta on its own, on the voluntary basis may have identified that certain people are involved in corruption so it can take on show motto on a own independent basis voluntary basis so the third statement is right that in most of the states loka yukta can investigate a show motto case but in some states like uttar pradesh himachal pradesh and assam he would not be able to do so on his own motion now let's look into the next practice question with respect to ninth schedule in the Indian constitution, which of the following statements is are correct? This schedule was added by the 42nd amendment by the Indira Gandhi government to protect laws included in it from judicial scrutiny on the ground of violation of fundamental rights. Even laws under the ninth schedule would be open to scrutiny if they violated fundamental rights or the basic structure of the constitution. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is two only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to Schedule 9 of the Indian Constitution. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, this schedule was added in the first constitutional amendment. It is not 42nd, but instead it is the first constitutional amendment. This was not added by Indira Gandhi government, but instead it was added by Jawaharlal Nehru's government. So the schedule became a part of the constitution in 1951 when the document was amended for the first time. This schedule was added to protect the laws from the judicial scrutiny. If we have to look at what Jawaharlal Nehru has to say, during a speech in parliament, Jawaharlal Nehru said, if there is an agrarian trouble, and insecurity of land tenure, nobody knows what is going to happen. Therefore, these long arguments and these repeated appeals in courts are dangerous to the state from security point of view, from the food production point of view and from the individual point of view, whether it is that of the zamindar or the tenant or any intermediary. 
what does this mean this means that the government will come up with certain land reforms and when people are opposed to these land reforms they will go to the court of law lot number of individuals will approach the court of law and when more people start going up there the ultimate purpose of the government to bring land reforms will not be satisfied and as a result so that there is no judicial scrutiny we will place some laws under nine schedule so that those laws cannot be checked by the judiciary this was the initial idea but then we have the supreme court of india in 2007 which also delivered a landmark judgment which said that supreme court can now scrutinize the laws that are even placed under the ninth schedule if it is violating the fundamental rights as well as the basic structure of the constitution it was a position where earlier if a law was placed in ninth schedule the supreme court could not look into it judicial review was not permissible but this was changed so in case even if a law is placed in ninth schedule if it is violating the fundamental rights if it is violating the basic structure of the Indian constitution in that case the judiciary would be able to look into that particular law and see if it is violating some of the basic norms of the constitution earlier it was a different position now with respect to this judgment it has clearly clarified that they would be able to scrutinize any law what was that landmark judgment the landmark judgment is called as the Koilo case also known as the ninth schedule case the court unanimously held that it was not permissible for for the legislature to escape the scrutiny of basic structure doctrine by finding manifestly cunning ways to get around it. The basic structure doctrine is very essence of the constitution and any acts, rules and regulations that violate its essence cannot be allowed to continue in this brazen manner. If any laws in the ninth schedule were inconsistent with part 3, they are liable to be struck down by the court. The ninth schedule was part of the constitution and as such, any alterations made to these parts which bypass the restrictions that are in place cannot be allowed to continue to the detriment of the well-established principles says the supreme court of india now let's look into the next practice question consider the following pairs we have valley on one side the state or the union territory it is present on the other side betab uttarakhand lidar sikkim pahalgam jammu and kashmir spiti himachal pradesh how many pairs given above are correctly matched the answer to this is only two pairs why have we taken this practice question because this article on the hindu finds a mention of the lidar river and this lidar river passes through the lidar valley which is present in the union territory of jammu and kashmir so because it passes through the lidar valley it derives its name which is called as the lidar river so if we look into these statements we have betab which is not in uttarakhand but it is in jammu and kashmir then we have lidar which is not in sikkim but once again in jammu and kashmir pahalgam is in jammu and kashmir and yes spiti is in himachal pradesh so third and the fourth are correctly matched so only two pairs are correctly matched so the answer to this would be b that is only two pairs if we speak about lidar valley we have this lidar river which flows through the lidar valley and when you consider the lidar river it originates from kolahai glacier and feeds the jhelum river this can be very important from the preliminary examination point of view and when we speak about betab valley this is a gorgeous expanse by the lidar river and offers panoramic views of the himalayas then we have pahalgam this once again is in the union territory of jammu and kashmir spiti valley is in himachal pradesh then we also have yumtung valley which is in sikkim and then we have the kangra valley which is in himachal pradesh as part of the assignment you have to put on the comment section which are some of the important valleys when it comes to madhya pradesh as well as andhra pradesh please put it on the comment section now let's look into the next practice question which of the following statements with respect to sea cucumbers is are correct they are marine invertebrates that are found only in salt water sea cucumber in india is listed under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act of 1972 brown sea cucumber is listed as endangered by iucn which of the statements are correct the answer to this is 1 2 and 3 
Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the sea cucumbers. Let us try and understand what are these statements. The statements given in this practice question are right. Yes, they are marine invertebrates that are found only in sea water. These sea cucumbers live on the sea floor and more than a thousand species of sea cucumber exist around the world. They are named so that is because it resembles a fat cucumber. If you see this particular picture this happens to be a sea cucumber it resembles that of a cucumber which is why it is called as the sea cucumber and is present on the sea floor and it is only present in the salty waters now if you look into the second statement it says sea cucumber in India is listed under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act yes this statement is right these are some of the measures that have been taken by the government of India to protect the sea cucumbers these are mentioned under schedule one of the wildlife protection act and as a result schedule one stands for the absolute protection and offenses under it and invite the highest penalty so as much as protection is provided to the tigers and the lions the same amount of protection is provided to the sea cucumber in india and which is why it is placed under schedule one of the wildlife protection then we have brown sea cucumber which is listed as endangered by iucn this statement is once again right its scientific name is Isothi hopus fuscus and this happens to be endangered so the third statement is also right what are the threats when it comes to this particular sea cucumber when we consider the sea cucumber they are the invertebrates they grow up to as much as six feet in length as well they are high in demand where let's say in china they are high in demand let's say in southeast asian part as well why because they feel that this particular species can be used in the traditional medicine going by the chinese tradition medicine consumption of these sea cucumbers can heal number of ailments including frequent urination impotence arthritis cancer so on and so forth as a result people actually smuggle it and send it across to Southeast Asia as well as to China. Sea cucumber extracts have also been used in China for making creams, oils and cosmetics as well. Apart from this direct threat, sea pollution, illegal fishing and over-exploitation are the other threats with respect to the sea cucumber. What is the significance of the sea cucumber? They are very crucial to the marine ecosystem and they perform similar functions like the earthworms that provide in the land ecosystem so whatever functions that earthworms provide in the land ecosystem similar functions are provided by the sea cucumber in the marine ecosystem so basically these sea cucumber are scavengers they move along the sea floor and they feed on tiny particles of algae or microscopic marine animals and ultimately they act like the scavengers they act like the garbage collectors of the ocean water and they also recycle the nutrients as well this happens to be the significance of the sea cucumber. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following pairs. We have peak on one side, the mountains on the other side. Namcha Barwa, Garwala Himalaya, Nanda Devi, Kumon Himalaya, Nokrek, Sikkim Himalaya. Which of the pairs given above is are correctly matched? The answer to this is two only. When you consider the first pair, Namcha Barwa associated with Garwala Himalaya, this is wrong. That is because Namcha Barwa is on the eastern point of the Himalayas and is located in Arunachal Pradesh. So the first one is wrong. No crack is not present in Sikkim Himalaya. No crack is the highest peak in the West Garo Hills of Meghalaya. So this is also wrong. And finally, yes, Nanda Devi is associated with Kumong Himalaya. So it is only two which is right. So the answer to this would be B. Now let's look into the fact of the day. The fact of the day for today's discussion is Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Where is it mentioned? It is mentioned in this article of the Hindu. So when we speak about Great Pacific Garbage Patch, what is it? It is a collection of marine debris. Where do we see it? We see it in the North Pacific Ocean. What is marine debris? It is the litter that ends up in the ocean. It ends up in the seas and other large bodies of water. So basically, when we are speaking about great pacific garbage patch it is the plastic debris that we see in this part of the ocean the great pacific carpet patch is also known as the pacific trash vortex 
and spans water from the western coast of North America to the eastern coast of Japan. So the patch is usually comprised of the western garbage patch and then what we have is the eastern garbage patch or the North Pacific subtropical high and this particular area located between United States of America that is California and we also have Japan is what is called as Great Pacific Garbage Patch. These areas of spinning debris are also linked to the North Pacific Subtropical Convergence Zone. These are located a few hundred kilometers north of Hawaii and at the same time this convergence zone is where warm water from the South Pacific meets up the cooler water from the Arctic and the zone acts like a highway that moves debris from one patch to another. Now when we look at the facts, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a large area of plastic debris in the Pacific Ocean between California and Hawaii. Garbage from the western coast of United States of America and eastern coast of Japan is brought into the North Pacific every year. Between 1.15 and 2.41 tons of plastic are predicted to enter ocean via rivers. According to a study, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch contains about 1.1 to 3.6 trillion particles of plastic. Based on their size, the plastic particles in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch are divided into four categories microplastic, mesoplastic, macroplastic, and megaplastic. The various forms of plastic are type H, which is hard plastic, type 1, which is plastic fibers, ropes, and fishing nets, type P, pre production plastic, spherical, and cylindrical objects, and type F, fragments of the foam materials. What are the concerns associated? with it the great pacific garbage patch receives a huge amount of things that are non-biodegradable meaning they do not break down in the water the sun's heat water currents pressure continue to break them down into tiny fragments and these are consumed by the aquatic animals and ultimately their life comes to an end the plastic and its other harmful compounds lead to bioaccumulation and biomagnification within the ecosystem and these tiny plastic fragments enter into the food web thereby ending Endangering lives of not just humans but also other animals as well. Microplastics are more dangerous to marine wildlife since they can now be confused for food and are eaten by fish, sea turtles, sea mammals, so on and so forth. These are some of the concerns that are associated with this great Pacific garbage patch. This is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.